And now, ladies and gentlemen, Skywalker. Thank you, Jim Davis, and thank you for tuning in. We've got a great show for you today, almost the end of April 2023. And today we go on location to this fake winery and talk to this man, T.J. Donnelly. He and Dallas radio personality, the late Terry Dorsey, brought radio one of the most hilarious bits of the 80s and 90s, Heine Wine. And today we get the true story behind Heine Wine. And joining us now from the headquarters, yeah, there are still headquarters for Heine Wine. Mr. T.J. Donnelly. T.J., it is such a pleasure to have you on the show. He is the man who knows the true story behind Heine. <laughs> yes, I do. Yes, I do. I, and I know a lot of stories. And, and, and I'm happy and to share them, too. How did this whole thing begin? Well, it, it began with us looking for a morning guy at KPLX in Dallas. Um, we had an opening there and I was the general manager of the station. So I was, um, I actually tried to hire Rick Dees and almost had him, uh, but the company didn't want to pay his asking price, even though he was willing to come. And so, uh, I realized pretty quickly that, uh, the company I was working for didn't have a whole lot of money for a morning guy. So I had to go out and find somebody. The problem we ran into with Rick was that he, he was asking a quarter of a million dollars for he and Julie to do the morning show, which was, I thought, reasonable for Dallas. But mm -hmm. Susquehanna, the parent company that owned the station, didn't think that was in our budget. Ron Chapman was the big morning personality at KVIL. And I was estimating that he was probably making somewhere between 350000 and half a million dollars a year doing morning drive at KVIL. Sure. So I didn't, think, I didn't think that was unreasonable. Anyhow, so I, I figured, okay, I don't have a whole lot of money. I got to go out and find somebody. So the program director of the station, Bobby Craig, had worked with a guy named Terry Dorsey. And so, uh, so I said, well, where is he? He said, well, he's in Dayton, Ohio. And I said, oh, what station? He says, well, it's, it's not a great radio station. It's number four. So I said, okay, so I looked it up. So Dayton was the number 63 market. So I'm in Dallas, Texas, and now all of a sudden we're looking at the guy at the number four station, the 63rd market, and I'm going, I don't know about this. This, this. this sounds like a career disaster for me, you know, to take a chance on this guy. So uh, so anyhow, he plays, he gives me the cassette and I listen to it and I go, well, yeah, it doesn't sound too bad. He sounds pretty good, really. So we, we send a plane ticket to Dayton and we fly him and his wife in. And uh, that night we go out to dinner, the four of us, uh, Bobby and, and uh, Logan, Terry's wife and Terry and me. And I, I got to tell you, for two hours, I laughed the entire two hours. And, you know, when you're looking for a morning guy, you want somebody who's a natural wit. And Terry was a natural wit. You know, I mean, he was great. So I took a chance and I got him for $35,000 a year. I couldn't believe it. You know, it was within budget, you know. So, uh, so anyhow, so we put him in the morning show. The company must have been pleased with you. Well, they didn't know what he was worth at this point. Nobody knew. You know, I'm taking a gamble. And uh, most of my radio buddies said, are you sure you made the right decision? And I said, well, I think so. You know, I think he's really, really good because I like the way he sounds and I like his personality. The first week, I guess he's doing Heine Wine, but I didn't really realize what he was doing, you know. And so I go by the reception desk uh, on a Friday, I guess it was. And she's, she's hanging up the phone. She actually takes the phone and slams it down into the receiver. And she says, God, I wish these people would stop calling and complaining. And I said, Barbara, who's calling and complaining? She says, I'm getting 80 phone calls a day from people complaining. And I, I, I'm just tired of these phone calls. I said, well, just a minute. Where's the form you're supposed to fill out? You're supposed to fill out a form when you get a complaint, put it on my desk, go straight to me. She says, well, they're not those kinds of complaints. These are people looking for the Heine Winery. They can't find it. They're going behind the library in Euless, and the only thing back there is the police station. And, and, of course, they're going to the police station trying to figure out, you know, where the winery is. So the police station is getting all these people. And I guess there's, you know, well, we figure we're getting 80 phone calls a day. So, you know, over a week, that was 400 phone calls roughly on average. So I'm going, gee whiz. And she says, well, you know, it's interesting how the phone calls are breaking out. We got about a third of them that think the Heine Winery is for real. They've been trying to buy Heine Wine and they can't buy it anywhere and they don't know what's going on. We got another third of them that uh, know this thing's a joke and they're having a good time with it. And then we got another third of them that want to know when we're going to get Heine Wine t-shirts because they want one, you know? So, <laughs> so I go, okay, so I meet with my promotions guy 
why don't we do some Heine Wine t-shirts? So we get together with Terry and we come up with a t-shirt and the t-shirt uh, had on the back a slogan. I asked Terry, you know, what do you want to put on the t-shirt? Well, back in those days, the Moose's Loose in Texas was a big t-shirt. You would see it from Moosehead Beer everywhere. So we had to put a slogan on the back. So he said, how's about ask me about my Heine? And I'm thinking, well, wait just a minute. Now we're in the Bible Belt, and we got some older people listening to this station. Is anybody actually going to wear a T-shirt that says, ask me about my Heine on the back? Right. So we said, well, let's do this. Let's get 1,000 T-shirts. We'll get 500 with ask me about my Heine on the back. And then we'll get 500 that have nothing on the back. And that way, when we send the first 500 out, if people don't want them, they can return them, and we'll give them the ones that don't have anything on it. So we said, okay, that's a plan. Let's do that. So Cherry goes on the air. And Heine Wine airs twice a day. It airs at uh, like roughly about 6.45 and 8.20, something like that. And the reason was we wanted to reach two different groups of people on their way to work. So at the end of the Heine Wine bit, which lasts about 90 seconds, and there's a, a different one every day. Mm -hmm. uh, he just does a quick 10 second thing. By the way, the Heine Winery is, is offering t-shirts if you like to get one, you know, send back in those days, it was $7. Send $7 to Honey Winery, post office box, whatever, in Euless, Texas. So we go down to Euless, we get a post office box, we get a bank account in the name of the Honey Winery. And so Terry does two of these 10 sec second spots on Monday, two 10 second spots on Tuesday, and two on Wednesday. And at 10 o'clock, my promotions director comes into my office and he says, hey, the post office called. They want to know when we're going to come down here and pick up our mail. And I said, oh, okay, well, take the station van down and go pick up the mail and bring it back and let's see what it is. So he goes down and he comes back with, and he, and he opens my door to my office and he says, do you want to see the mail? I said, well, yeah, sure, I want to see it. So he takes this sack. It looks like something Santa Claus would be carrying on his back. And he throws it on my floor of my office and he says, there's 1,700 orders here for Heine Wine t-shirts. And I'm going, holy mackerel. Well, we did, we, we ended up selling just in one month, 7,000 Heine Wine t-shirts. You know, I belong to a group of broadcasters called the International Broadcasters Idea Bank. And we exchanged newsletters every, every month. And there was always different subjects on their promotions and stuff. That, and it was people at all different radio stations all over the world. Actually, we had stations in New Zealand and Australia. And so uh, the big topic of discussion always was, how come Radio Shack doesn't buy radio? I mean, this is strange. This should be an account that should be on the radio, but they never are. And a lot of stations tried to get them on the radio and they couldn't as advertisers. So we were fortunate that their corporate headquarters for the Tandy Corporation, which owned Radio Shack, was in Fort Worth. And so I went to my sales manager and I said, okay, I got a deal. Let's go get Radio Shack on the air. I'm going to prove to these guys at these other 99 radio stations that we can do something impossible. We're going to get Radio Shack on the air. So we went to them, and the idea was that we would go to a Radio Shack store, have a live appearance of Terry Dorsey, and he would autograph Heine Wine t-shirts, and you could buy them. The money, by the way, was going to Stars for Children. So we go pitch it to, to Radio Shack. And so... Uh, my sales manager comes back and he says, well, I, I, I don't know. We might get an order. We'll see. So two days go by and I say, well, what's, what's the deal on Radio Shack? Are, are they going to go or not? Because you know, we're going to pitch it to somebody else if they don't want to do it because this thing's hot. So he goes, yeah, they're going to do it. I said, really? Radio Shack, we broke it? He says, no, we didn't break it. <laughs> what do you mean we didn't break it? He says, they own a company called Brands Western Wear, which has seven locations in Dallas. And since we're a country station, they want to do the remote at Brands, uh, Brands Western Wear store. I said, oh, okay. I mean, they're big stores. So they had one in Arlington, which is where the station was located. So we decided we'd put Terry Dorsey in the Arlington store. We'd take uh, 500 t-shirts and we'd do a three-hour remote and Terry would autograph t-shirts. So uh, the remote goes on and uh, about an hour and a half into it, we've already sold 500. <laughs> We're out of t-shirts. So the promotion guy gets back in the van, goes back to the station, gets 500 more T-shirts, brings them back. And we ended up selling right around uh, 700 or 800 T-shirts during that three-hour remote. The next day, I'm, I'm going to my sales manager. I'm saying, okay, 
this thing went good, right? And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, it was great. Radio Shack loves it. I mean, our brand's Western wear loves it. But they said, we made a big mistake. And I said, we made a mistake. He says, yes, we made a major error with that promotion. I said, holy mackerel, what did we do? He said, we should have had them in all seven stores. They said people were showing up in the other stores wanting to buy Honeyway t-shirts. They said they could have sold 2,000 of them if we'd have had them. And I was going, man, this thing is really hot. It was astronomical. Yeah. It does wonders for the ratings. Correct? Yes. The rating book comes out. Terry Dorsey's first rating book. And we jumped up from, you got to remember, KPLX, when I went there, was the number 17 station in Dallas. Uh, the number one station was KSCS, which was a country, we were country and they were country. They had a 12 share. We had like a one point something, a 1.3 or 1.4, something like that. And I think the first book out with Terry Dorsey, we had jumped up to uh, a 2.3 five or 2.6 so we were making some gains and uh actually i think it was higher than that come to think of it it was probably more like a 3.5 i mean we had we had doubled the audience in in one rating book uh, i left i had a disagreement with with susquehanna so i left shortly thereafter I, I made a lot of my disagreements had to do with money and how they were spending it and you know i mean i was fortunate i was able to get terry for thirty five thousand dollars a year but uh, I mean, that's, that, was the bar- that was the bargain of the century, really, when you think about it. Is this when you and Terry Dorsey decide, you know, we need to syndicate this bit? I said, well, you know, I know these hundred guys that belong to the Idea Bank, and I used to be, used to head up a media buying service. I placed tons of radio advertising, so I know a lot of decision makers. I mean, they know me. They'll take my phone call because they know my name. Let's maybe pair up. I'll take all my contacts I have and the fact that I was a radio sales manager and you take your creative abilities and let's see what we can do with Honey Wine. So we said, okay. So we started Dorsey and Donnelly Enterprises. So we produce a demo tape. I, I write the demo copy. Terry goes to KPLX and produces it and he gives me the master. So we're dubbing off cassettes and, and we were so, it was so undercapitalized that we were taking uh, a cassette, two cassette players and wiring them together and taking the master tape and put it in one and then running off a blank tape on the other. And the impedance levels were so far off it had a hum in it when you said, when you said, when you sent out the cassette. So I'm sending out the cassettes because you know you have to mail it out. So I send out the cassettes and people are calling me back saying, uh, hey, that's pretty funny. I think I might want to pick that up, you know, on my radio station. I said, by the way, what was that hum? In the- <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, you must have got a bad, you must have got a bad copy. I don't know what that was. They were all like that. You know, so, uh, so anyhow, the first month, me on the telephone, uh, just calling up people I knew in, in, in the radio business, uh, I sold, and we were selling this feature for cash. The thing I didn't tell you was we also had three major write-ups in, in the major daily newspapers, Fort Worth Star-Telegram, the Dallas Morning News, and the, at that time, the Herald Examiner, which was the afternoon paper. Right. And these were full-page write-ups. It wasn't just a little story. It had pictures in it and had people searching for the Heine Winery right. and Ulysses and all this sort of stuff. So, you know, we took the copies of, I mean, I took the copies of the newspaper stories and uh, told them about the t-shirt thing with, with uh, Tandy Corporation and... Uh, and sent them sample scripts so they could see it. And, you know, and of course the demo tape was good because Terry did a couple of examples of him doing it at KPLX. So he could actually hear what it sounded like on the air. And uh, so that was, you know, that was really what happened. But it was a, you had to sell the, you had to sell it as a programming feature because the morning guy had to want to do it. If the morning guy or the morning girl or the team or wherever it was that was doing the morning show didn't want to do it, we weren't going to sell it. You know, I mean, it was just, you couldn't force somebody to do something they didn't want to do. Right. Um, right. But the general managers in most cases understood what it was going to do for the ratings. because so they saw the rating success over at KPLX and they saw the newspaper stories and they, they understood the t-shirt sales. So the, the general manager really got it, you know, and that was the guy that really made the decision. In most cases, he would convince the morning guy or the program director, we need to try this out. And I think in the beginning, I think we were given 30 day, well, maybe we didn't do that till later because I didn't want to ruin the, the, the feature because we sell it on a market exclusive. And, uh, you know, you don't want to on the air for 30 or 60 days at station A 
and then not be on it anymore and then try to sell it to station B when it didn't work out at station A. So everything was a one-year contract that was automatically renewable the second year. And the payments were made over a period of time. We weren't bartering the feature at that time for airtime. We were selling it for cash. Wow. But in the first three months, I think uh, the total was about $106,000 worth of sales that, that I had made. Uh, again, putting that today's money, that's $300,000, you know. Did you guys anticipate that this was going to be uh, a, 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 such a success? No, I, I think it was frankly just a marriage of two guys that had different talents, you know. Uh, mine was sales and contacts and Terry was creative, you know. And uh, Terry was not only a good morning personality, but he's, a, he's an exceptionally uh, creative writer. And uh, he really knew how to make this work. And, um, you know, he, uh, you got to remember, there's a different Heine wine commercial every single day. And so, and the reason you do that is you don't want to run the same bit more than one day because you've got to give people a reason to tune in the next day. And the reason to tune in the next day is to hear the new different Heine wine commercial. Did he write every Heine wine commercial? He, he wrote them all in the beginning. Uh, I'm going to say into year about eight, uh, I started hiring some writers to uh, try to put a different spin on it a little bit, you know. And it was interesting what happened. Uh, you know, we had developed a service uh, called National Comedy Wireless, which was a produced uh, morning show bits. These were fake commercials and stuff that were done by different radio personalities in different markets. And so we had maybe eight or nine different morning guys in different markets uh, put some honey wine commercials together, and they were actually pretty good. Uh, the interesting thing was when you bring in a different writer, you get a whole different spin on it. Yeah. And so we were getting stuff that was, and of course, I was writing a few myself. I mean, I had a few I was pretty proud of, but anyhow, uh, you know, I'll give you an example. Um, one thing Terry never wrote about in his scripts was uh, about the squatters that took over the Heine Winery. And so I started writing some scripts about squatters that had uh, overtaken some vacant buildings at the, the Heine Winery. <laughs> And, you know, it, that thing kind of took a life of its own. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know why Terry missed the squatters, but it was kind of a natural, you know, to have squatters at the winery. So uh, that was one that I, one series that I was pretty proud of. We had another one that we uh, that I did was uh, the the Heine Winery decided to open up a crab house restaurant. And so it became the Heine Winery and Crab House. And their slogan was. I went for the Heine and I got the crabs, you know. <laughs> <laughs> How soon did you guys start producing uh, jingles and songs for Heine wine? Because that was such a big part of the bit. Well, uh, when Terry started doing Heine wine for the first time on KPLX, the listeners kind of got into it quite a bit. So there was a group of young ladies called the Honey Buns. That was their name, they, the name they gave themselves. <laughs> so they took a tape recorder into the bathroom at wherever they were. And they did some a cappella jingles. And so they sent them to Terry. So it was like the second week he was on the air, all of a sudden he's got jingles now. And actually the girl sounded pretty good. So uh, he was running, I think they, were, they sent about five of them. And they didn't last long. They were about five to ten seconds. So he would run the Heine Wine you know, script. And then he would tag it at the end with this jingle. He really didn't get many more for the next year or so that he was at KPLX. But when we started syndication... All of a sudden, now we've got all these radio stations running it. And so uh, I decided that we, sh we should do a national jingle contest and see what happens, you know, because at that point we were on maybe uh, 75 to 80 stations. So if we did a national jingle contest and offered a prize of $500 with a honey wine merchandise with the understanding that whatever they send in becomes our property because we own the trademark and copyright, uh, that we might get some pretty good jingles. And we did. I mean, we got some unbelievable jingles. One that won the national jingle contest one year was done by a production company in San Francisco. And then uh, a guy named Bobby Caldwell, who was in Dallas, did a couple of full length songs. And so those were two and a half to three minutes each. So now all of a sudden, uh, when we're syndicating it, oh, by the way, Toby Arnold owned, a, uh, I don't know if you know who Toby Arnold is, but he's since passed away. But anyhow, he owns a recording studio in Dallas. 
And of course, we're in Dallas. And the uh, big thing about Dallas is there's, you know, TM is here. So we have all these jingle production companies here. So I knew Toby real well. We were personal friends. And so I went over to see him at his studio and I said, hey, can you cut me some honey wine jingles? I want something that really sounds first class. So he said, yeah, sure. So we we ended up doing that. And I think we ended up getting a package of uh, 10 to 15 full you know, jingles done by studio singers. I mean, this is really good stuff. So, uh, I, but anyhow, the end result was we had about 90 to 95 of these. Uh, so when we syndicated it, you know, all of a sudden now we were offering 95 jingles and songs to go along with it. So the, the, the value of the feature becomes more. The interesting thing is KPLX, who didn't pay for anything, <laughs> gets to use all this stuff, you know, because Dorsey's there. So uh, they're getting the benefits of everything, which is fine, you know, because uh, anything that uh, Terry did on KPLX was good for us as, as far as syndication was concerned. So we were, we were happy to send it over there and let them use it. So that's what was happening. We would we would get into a market like uh, Dallas was a good example. So the, we'd go to Waco, you know, and, and Abilene and Wichita Falls and all these surrounding markets and basically tell them about what KPLX was doing in Dallas. Because you know, that, that perked their ears up right away because they wanted, particularly, you know, we're talking to a country station in that market. KPLX is a country station, so it just makes sense. Um, and we tell them about the success. We have copies of the, all the news. You know, you know, we had hundreds of newspaper stories uh, uh, from every market that we were in. We had grown by by the second year. We had grown quite a bit. So we had uh, we had you know two or three people that were just selling syndication, mm -hmm. and then we had a group of people that were in our merchandise uh, area. You know, we were making our own merchandise. We didn't have a fulfillment company. We had a warehouse and it was full of t-shirts and baseball caps and all this sort of stuff. And we had suppliers that were bringing, sending us stuff. Our, our t-shirt manufacturer was in North Carolina of all places. Um, but that was a, a garment area, you know, that's where the big clothing industry was. And so uh, I went to North Carolina and found a company and I think they went outside of Charlotte. And they were just a huge manufacturer of T-shirts. So they became our T-shirt production company. You know, back in those days, you know, uh, the FCC limited you to 7 AMs and 7 FMs. Right. So, uh, and so the every market was competitive. It isn't like it is now where uh, iHeartMedia has six stations and Chimulus has seven and CBS has eight, you know, or, or whatever the number of stations. Uh, each market, you were limited to two stations. So mm -hmm. when you go to a market now, the competitive situation was extremely intense. And so uh, we just found out that uh, just working stations against each other was 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 the way to make it work for us, you know. And, but, you know, we tended to be the most focused group um, feature probably in the history of radio because the question mark was, are people going to be offended by this thing, you know? And radio stations didn't really know because, as you know, we're the black box. We don't know what's going on on the other side of the black box. You have no idea. Uh, you just know you're sending a, a message out, but you have no idea what the reactions, reaction is. So you go to focus group interviews. And um, uh, Clear Channel uh, did quite a few focus group interviews. ABC did. Uh, most of the major group, RKL, most of the major groups did that. And uh, there was a company, I know you remember, called the Research Group, which was really big back then. They were doing all kinds of focus group interviews and research all over the country. So uh, th there were interesting in the focus group interviews. Number one, the demographic was 25 to 49. I mean, that was by far the number one demographic we discovered. But And, and they shared the research with us because they said, hey, you need, you need to know what's going on with these focus groups. And so the two things, there were two things we heard. Number one, women thought it was cute which I really liked. I know it was cute. Yeah. Men thought it was hilarious. And those were the two words that kept coming out. Yeah. So of course we use that uh, when we were talking to, to radio stations saying, Hey, here's some research we're willing to share with you based on what we're being told, you know, mm -hmm. because we didn't want it to get into the area of people thinking it was blue. And we really had to be extremely careful of that because, you know, people can get offended and, um, uh, we didn't want that to happen. And and actually, we had a couple of stations that, unfortunately, the DJ decided to make it a blue feature and it bombed. And so, uh, yeah. you know, it's a scripted, it's a scripted feature. So, you know, sometimes you don't know what somebody's going to do with it once they get it, you know. What I liked about it is you put the Heine wineries in uh, small 
obscure uh, towns near the near the station. Yeah, you know, there's vapors that come from the winery. So the first thing you have to decide is, does the town want to be known as the town that smells like Heine? Because <laughs> that, is, that, that is the notation that, that, or the designation that that town gets eventually. But uh, we warn the stations, we say, okay, you have two choices in deciding what kind of a town you want to have. You can either go with an incorporated town that has a city council and a uh, mayor and all that stuff. I mean, you got to be careful because those guys are organized. <laughs> organized. Or you can go with an unincorporated town, you know, that's like, uh, you know, independent, doesn't have a mayor, doesn't have a any kind of a, a, a municipal structure whatsoever. And so we warned them. We said, now, if you go with an incorporated town, you got to understand that if they don't like it, they're going to get organized and they're going to let you know. If it's unincorporated, you don't need to worry about it because these people, these people can never get together on anything. So nothing's going to happen to you. So uh, so anyhow, we had, I, I guess the best uh, story I can think of was WRVQ in Richmond, it, which, which is a big powerhouse rocker in Richmond, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And uh, Phil Goldman was the manager. And we used to do these, uh, I think I may have mentioned it before, we used to do these uh, wine festival commercials. You did tiny wine festival commercials, which would run for a week. And it would be leading up to a big Saturday festival that was, it was supposed to take place in the small town. And you guys did this in quite a few markets. Yeah. But it wasn't, it, it was just make-believe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did, 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 there, there was uh, there wasn't a wine tasting festival, but you're amazing how many people ended up showing up for it. I mean, sometimes it was hundreds and hundreds of people that would go and drive sometimes fifty miles to you, you know you gotta understand if you're a class C FM, your signal may go out 125 miles. Well, if you're a somebody that lives on the eastern border of the signal, and he's going to have to travel to the winery town, which is on the western side of the border. He's going to drive 250 miles to go to a wine tasting festival that doesn't exist. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, so, I mean, we did this for about, you know, I think we did it for maybe <laughs> a couple of months. And it got to be so bizarre, you know, with all these people showing up. So anyhow, so you got to, so anyhow, Short Pump, Virginia is outside of Richmond. It's a little town. It's got four stores in an intersection, and that's it. And one of the stores is a convenience store. An elderly lady owns it. She's not in the demographics of the WRVQ. WRVQ is a, a teen to 18 to 34 station. This lady's 60 years old. So she doesn't know anything about the Heine Winery. So all of a sudden, we do the wine tasting festival, and a uh, carload of people show up at 8 o'clock in the morning at, at, at her store and say, hey, I need directions. I'm here for the Heine Winery <laughs> Wine Tasting Festival. She goes, where is it? She says, it was right here in, in Short Pump. You know, I'm, I'm here for it. I can't find it. She said, look, I've lived here all my life. If there was a winery here, I'd know about it. You see these four buildings? This is Short Pump. There is no more to it than four buildings. There's no winery here. We don't know what you're talking about. So they go, okay, well, we'll keep on looking. So they buy some crackers and, you know, maybe a honey bun or two and some coffee and get some gas and keep on searching for the Heine Winery. About 10 minutes later, another carload of people shows up. Same thing. They come in asking for directions to the Heine Winery, and she goes, I don't know what's going on here, but there is no Heine Winery here. <laughs> so, so the third carload of people shows up, and of course, these people are buying stuff in her store. Third carload of people shows up and says, hey, uh, we're looking for the, for the wine tasting festival at the Heine Winery. And all of a sudden, the bell goes off, and she goes, uh... It's around here somewhere because I see their trucks <laughs> on the side. <laughs> she calls up Monday morning. She calls WRVQ <laughs> and talks to Phil, Phil Goldman, the manager, and says, uh, Mr. Goldman, I want to let you know something. Keep that Heine Wine thing going. I had the most successful day in the history of my business, uh, you know, that, that weekend. She had the most successful weekend. So um, I was talking to um, one of my old sales managers at KPLX, uh, a few uh, weeks ago, and I said, you know, I left KPLX, so I wasn't sure what was going on there all the time because I was so focused on running my business. I really wasn't paying a whole lot of attention to to KPLX. And he said, all I know is one day I came to work and there was a semi-tractor trailer 
trailer in the in the parking lot full of Heine Wine t-shirts. So they were selling a ton of them. And so uh, so we kind of looked at the model there uh, of what was going on at KPLX. And we said, OK, let's just take that model and we'll replicate it, you know, in, in other markets. So the T-shirt thing became a big deal. I think it was in Orlando. We own a BJ 105 in Orlando, which is a great radio station. Yeah. And uh, they did decided they were going to do a Heine Wine remote. Well, they made a mistake. They only bought a gross of shirts. They should not have bought 144 shirts. They should have bought 500 shirts. <laughs> so they do this remote and 300 people show up and they only got 144 shirts. I think it was at a car dealer. And so, so anyhow, they thought, well, we'll you know, we'll just sell the shirts and everything. Well, the thing they didn't realize was that some of these uh, people had traveled quite a few miles to go to this remote. And uh, they actually had fist fights going on in the parking lot at the car dealership with people grabbing uh, shirts out of other people's hands so that they could get them because they knew there were only a few shirts and they were hard. They weren't, there were more people than there were shirts. I see in the tiny wine headquarters there, I guess it's still in effect. All the products you had, were those Heine Wine uh, spritzers? As far as the merchandise line was concerned, uh, I sat down with Terry and I told him what we wanted to do. And, you know, Terry's our creative genius. So I said, you know, let's come up with a product line, you know, that we can sell other than T-shirts. And so uh, the T-shirts were going really well. So we came up with a baseball cap, which is kind of interesting. I, I don't know you, but you can probably see it. Uh, it's an mm -hmm. official Heine Inspector baseball cap. Mm -hmm. By the way, this was real big with proctologists. They really enjoy <laughs> having those. Okay. So the t-shirts were the most popular item. The baseball caps were right up there. And I think uh, probably the night shirt was our number two or number three item. We probably sold over 100,000 of those. And that said, tonight's the night for honey. And that was a big seller. We did really well. And then we had different things uh you know we had an apron that says i put my hiney and everything i cook you know <laughs> and uh ashtrays that don't put your butt out my hiney you know and of course you know the bumper sticker you got over your head there that was uh that was uh, an advertising agency i did business with in arlington came up with that that was kind of a surprise uh i he was doing a lot of artwork for me and and uh, coming up and he actually came up with the if you look at the grapes very closely on these uh, items like the Heine wine uh, thing. They look mm -hmm. like little Heinies, you know, they don't look like yeah. grapes. Look like yeah. So he yeah. came up with that and he also came up with the bumper sticker. And I remember going over there, he just said, hey, I got something for you. And he said, if you turn the heart upside, <laughs> if you turn the heart upside down, it looks like a Heine. And I said, oh, well, that's great. You know, so we, I bet we, we sold 200,000 <laughs> of the uh, bumper stickers. In Southern California, it was a big deal. And I think that uh, was in part due to Rick Dees because he really played it. Oh, yeah. Rick, Rick, as you know, is a phenomenal talent. And, you know, he's uh, Rick and I are friends, obviously, because, you know, he was my morning guy at WHBQ in, in Memphis before he went to Los Angeles. And in fact, I went to his and Julie's wedding, you know, when they got married in Indianapolis. In fact, I just saw him a few months, uh, a few, few years ago at Dwight Case's funeral in, in Los Angeles. And so, anyhow, I, well, the three best markets we had by far were Dallas, Texas, obviously because of Terry, oh. um, the Los Angeles, Rick did a, just a phenomenal job, and oh. Sonny Fox at Y100 in Miami was, uh, he and Footy, uh, his uh, sports guy, were just absolutely phenomenal, and they did a great job. I think we were in Miami for 11 or 12 years. Uh, Rick had us for 12 years or 13 years, I think. Of course, Terry had it on the air here for maybe 10, 12 years. You know, we, we would always get phone calls. So I get a call from, I can't remember the name of the radio station, but there was this little town. And unfortunately the town didn't have any stoplights. And so, you know, when you send two or 300 cars to a town that doesn't have any stoplights, it causes the traffic problem. There's nobody, so what happens is, you know, if they have a, a policeman, you know, many, some of these towns actually have one policeman working there. And in most cases, he doesn't have a whole lot to do because there's not a whole lot of crime because there may be only 100, 200 people live in this town. So when we send two, three hundred carloads of people there, it causes a real traffic problem. So we got a call from one of the towns saying, they call, I mean, they called the station complaint and said, hey, 
you got to stop sending all these people out here. Fred, our policeman, had to go out and direct traffic. He was directing traffic for eight hours. <laughs> he was standing at the major intersection in town to make sure these cars didn't crash into each other. <laughs> You know, he was complaining it was the worst day he'd ever had in his life. Uh, we had another WIL in St. Louis uh, country station did a really good job of this. And so they decided to put the Heine Winery in a town called Herculaneum, Missouri. And so it became, of course, known as the town that smells like Heine. And all these people are showing up for the wine tasting festival. So the, this is an organized <laughs> This is an organized town. This one actually has a mayor and a city council. So they, they call up the manager of WIL and they go, you're going to have to stop this honey wine thing. You know, we got all these people coming in here and they're bothering our people, asking us for directions. And um, we want you to stop it. So the station kind of thinks about it. The program director, they say, OK, let's 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 move to another town. So so they go ahead and they decide they're going to move the Heine Winery. So they go on the air and they say, uh, Herculaneum doesn't want the, the Heine Winery anymore. So if you live in a town and you'd like the Heine Winery moved to your town, let us know. You can send us a petition and we will look at the votes. And the town that gets the most votes, the Heine Winery is going to move to your town. So there's a, a rival town like right near there called Peavey or Peavey or something like that. And there's a guy that owns a gas station there. So he gets a petition together and he gets, you know, two, three hundred names on this petition to move the Heine winery from Herculaneum to Peavey. Well, the minute that the Herculaneum people figured out that they were going to move it to Peavey, Peavey or Peavey, I can't remember the exact name of the town. Uh, they didn't like that at all because the deal was going to be. Another business has left Herculaneum <laughs> and moved to Peavely. So they got all upset that, you know, they didn't want the winery, but they didn't want to move to Peavely. So, <laughs> so they call up the manager at WIL and say, well, just a minute, we had a change of heart now. <laughs> we want you moving the Heidi <laughs> We want to stay in here because we don't want to go to Peavely. So they had a meeting, and apparently what happened was, the, I think it was the 100th anniversary of Her Herculaneum was coming up, and there was going to be a big festival in the town square in Herculaneum. So they got together with the station, and they actually produced a can, because Heine Wine comes in a can, and they did a can that looked like a can of Heine Wine, and it had a memorial comment in the back celebrating the 100th an anniversary of Herculaneum. And they promoted it on WIL. And, of course, they sent a bunch of people there, you know, uh, the radio station did, because they did a live remote from there, too. And so that um, was kind of an interesting thing, you know, that kind of flipped itself around. Um, we did have a couple of, of, of stations that wanted, for some reason or another, to move the Heine Winery. So we had um, a series of uh, fire scripts where the Heine Winery burnt down, you know. And yeah. Terry produced <laughs> Terry produced them, and they were like live commentaries from the fire, and they were really funny. And so we would say, "You can burn, you can burn down the winery if you want to, and move it to another town." And we'll even send you the scripts. It has uh, Big Red Heine and Thor Heine talking to the fire department about what they're doing with uh, with the fire and everything. And it's pretty funny, and you'll you'll enjoy it. And then you can make some money because when you when you move the winery to a new town, you can start selling construction. <laughs> Construction companies, commercials, the official carpet company. <laughs> what was a uh, Heine Gate? Well, you know, uh, we were on WTVN in Columbus, Ohio, which carries the Ohio State football game. They had a guy that Eric Nesta was his name. He he had done a bunch of jingles and songs for, for WTVN, and he had a little comedy routine he did in, did in nightclubs there. So I get a call from the program director. He says, are you looking for another syndicated feature? And I went, well, yeah, we're always looking for something, you know. And he said, well, why don't you come to Columbus? I want you to meet Eric Nesta. So he sent me some samples of what he was doing. It sounded pretty good. I wasn't sure whether it was entirely syndicatable, but I wanted to see his act live. So I flew to Columbus, and I go to WTVN, and uh, the program director gives me a tour of it. And he says, hey, I want to let you know this honey wine thing's really hot. You know, I said, well, good. I'm, I'm glad it's working for you. And he said, uh, I want to do something. And I think I have to get a release from you, according to my attorneys, to do it. And I said, well, what do you want to do? He says, we want to do tailgating parties at Ohio State, but we want Big Red and Thor to sponsor them. And we want to call them Heinegate parties. 
Okay, that sounds good. I think, you know, because that could, if it works here at Ohio State, that it could work, you know, in other markets where we're in college towns and so forth. So they devised this Heine Gate thing. And uh, I think they had Heine wine on the air for two or three years. So they didn't have a license after a while, but they went ahead and continued with Heine Gate. And I think it ended up, you can go on YouTube and type in Heine Gate and you're going to be amazed at what you see. Whose idea was it to uh, come up with actually producing a bottle of Heine wine? Yeah. Well, so anyhow, well, the John Labatt Brewing Company, you know, they make Labatt's Blue Beer in Toronto. They owned a winery in uh, the Giorgio, California. That was not doing well. It wasn't making any money. So they contact me and they say, we want to produce a Heine wine. We want to do it non-alcoholic because that's really big out here you know, in California. And all these non-alcoholic bars are opening up and eventually they're going to sweep the nation. We signed a contract with them. And it was, it was a good deal uh, for us. Um, they, uh, they agreed to produce 100,000 cases. They would pay us a dollar a case royalty for the use of our trade name because wow. we trademarked, you know, trademarked honey wine. And, and, and what were your thoughts behind that? Because I, I, I thought once you produced an actual bottle of honey wine, you did lose the mystique. Um, that, that was just my personal feeling. We didn't distribute the non-alcoholic wine in Los Angeles. Uh, right. Again, it was up to, if Rick didn't want it, we weren't going to do it. You know, that was right. it because, uh, you know, we're radio people. I mean, right. we're broadcasters. My background is radio. Right. I'm not going to do anything that's going to offend a radio station because that's my livelihood, you know. Right. And so, um, so anyhow, we we rolled it out. But what they sent a, they sent us advance royalty payments. I mean, it was a hundred thousand cases, a dollar case. So they wrote me a check for a hundred thousand dollars. And so the check comes in. Of course, Terry's my partner. Right. So I call up Terry and said, hey, Terry, you need to come on over for a, a meeting. I've got something for you. <laughs> and he says, okay. So he comes in. He's a genial guy. You know, he's a good guy. So he comes over and I said, here, here's a check for $50,000. It's your half. And he goes, well, what happened? And I said, well, you know, we signed that contract and the check came in and, and you know, we're making money. So, I mean, we it's part of the profit. So here's your check for $50,000. And I did the same thing with the wine cooler. We 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 did a hundred thousand dollar advance royalty payment on that, and I was able to give uh, Terry another check. So you you work for um, major companies. I work for RKO, and you know Dwight Case was my mentor. Pat Norman, the general manager at KFRC, was my other mentor during the time I was at WHBQ and working for RKO. And there was an old saying: "So goes the morning show, so goes the radio station." You know, and so. As you know, with Rick Dees, you know, you had to have a, a morning guy there. And so my attitude was that, you know, the morning show was the most important thing that we had to take care of. There other stuff could I mean, I'm, I'm, I worked with Rick Dees. I mean, I know what this is all about. And mm -hmm. I worked with some really good people in Indianapolis. Too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, getting back to the non-alcoholic wine, you know, it, it all this uh, de-alcoholized wine process and everything they were doing. I mean, I actually went to the winery in DiGiorgio and Baker, outside of Bakersfield and met with these people up there. Um, it never took off. You know, that whole thing didn't work. And so I think Labatt decided, you know, we weren't going to continue it, even though they did sell 100,000 cases, which is, you know, 1.2 million bottles. Mm -hmm. And so they, they, they did sell that. Um, the next thing we did come up with was a wine cooler. That was a group of investors from Miami. Again, it gets back to Y100, you know, and having all these great radio stations on the air. But we caught the tail end of the wine cooler business just as it was dying. So timing's everything. And unfortunately, we did not time that perfectly. If we just started it maybe three years earlier, it would it would have been a continuing product, but it would have died eventually along with Bartles and James. You know, it just... Uh, Right, it dried up. Uh, my background was running a country station in Dallas, and and KLIF too. I ran Cliff also, and so I'm over there at Dorsey and Donnelly Enterprises, and uh, it's 1985, and uh, somebody I don't know who it was gets uh, uh, nominated an elective Country Music Association Major Market DJ of the Year, and I'm thinking. Terry Dorsey wasn't even nominated for this, and he's got the most successful comedy bit maybe in the history of radio. Uh, this isn't adding up, you know? So 
1986 comes about and I go to the staff there, you know, we've got such great contacts with program directors and, and, and I think the way the CMA award works, it's voted on by the program directors of country music radio stations all over the United States. That both, you know, they, they get to cast votes. So we get on the phones and we just start calling people and people go, oh yeah, I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, you're right. He deserves it. He deserves it. So, uh, and he wins it. He wins CMA. DJ of the year in 1986. Now, I don't know what KPLX did about that. I don't know whether they gave him a bonus or anything. I mean, we had a little party over at the office, you know, because we were celebrating it. But um, I don't know whether they really appreciated it that much. Um, if it was me, I mean, I was running the radio station, I'd make sure I didn't lose that guy. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, that's all I'm thinking. I don't want this guy going somewhere else, you know, so I'm mm -hmm. going to take really good care of him. Right. But 1988 rolls around and KSCS uh, is getting hammered. The, the, the other competing uh, country station is getting hammered by KPLX in the ratings. And of course, they know the secret. The secret is so goes the morning show, so goes the radio station, you know, so... So anyhow, so uh, John Hare, who was the manager of KSCS was a friend of mine. When I started my business, he ended up uh, and I ended up doing a lot of business together. And I think it totaled almost $3 million in business. Uh, I was buying his billboards for him for both for all of his radio stations all over Dallas and Fort Worth for five years, you know. So he had, he, we had a great relationship. So he, he basically called me up and said, hey, I, I want to talk to you about Terry Dorsey, you know. I said, okay, fine. So I go over to the station he, when we talk. And I knew what they were up to. I knew that they were, you know, looking to do something with Terry Dorsey. And they, he said, uh, you know, I just want to make sure you don't say anything to anybody about this meeting. And I said, no, we didn't have this meeting. I said, you know, uh, I'll tell you what I know. Uh, and, you know, I don't mind sharing it with you because you do $3 million worth of business with me. KPLX doesn't do anything. <laughs> so, so I'm going to take care of the people that take care of me. And so he said, you know, he didn't say anything. We ended the meeting. And I, I don't know where the meeting was on a Monday or Tuesday, but anyhow, I have to go to New Orleans. I have a bunch of friends that are, uh, we leave on a Thursday and we're going to spend the weekend in New Orleans with a bunch of friends of ours from Texas. And the, one of them is a doctor and he, uh, he can't come. So he shows up on Saturday. So he shows up on Saturday. He says, Oh, did you hear about your business partner? And I go, no, what? I've been in New Orleans. I don't, I don't know. He says, he's leaving KPLX and he's going to KSCS. They just announced it. I said, holy man. Well, I knew something was going on, you know. But I think what happened with Terry and I was, uh, you know, he was making so much money. And I, I think he got to the point where he was uh, getting a little bit tired of, of honey wine, you know. Mm -hmm. And so he he sold it to me. Basically, I agreed to, you know. So I ended now. up with honey wine and he ended up with uh, with a very, you know, good career situation. So, so mm -hmm. you know, that's kind of how that happened. Uh, my media buying business, you know, really took off. I got involved with uh, with placing amusement park accounts. You know, Six Flags became my biggest client, and then you know, Premier Parks is another one. And 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 so I had these major corporations that you know, I was placing their amusement park business for. Them. And then we got into direct into direct response. You know, with with um, uh, purity products and people like that placing half hour infomercials on radio stations. So, mm -hmm. um, so I, I kind of took a different direction and to be truthful, I really haven't had anybody in charge of honey wine. Don't you think, do you feel it's run, it's run its course? It's, you know, demographically it probably hasn't because the people that were big fans were in the 25 to, or 25 to 49 year old age group in the eighties. So there's a whole new group of 25 to 49 year olds that don't have a clue what this is. I mean, they've That's never right. heard it. It's all brand new. And the demographics haven't changed as far as the target audience is concerned. Are there actual morning personalities out there that can pull it off? You know, the other thing you're faced with is syndicated morning shows. You know, you've got uh, so many syndicated morning shows out there that that there is no local person doing morning drive. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, it can be done. You know, the, the mystique of the winery isn't there because people know it's fake and you can find that out by going on the Internet. But you also know the Simpsons are fake, you know, and it's it's really more the, the content of, of the, the comedy that's important. 
And so but I will that say, has... and I and I agree, it's all about the content. But in the beginning, the mystery, the mystique of Heine wine right. was just so incredibly amazing. And it it's funny how some people enjoyed it the the bit and understood it was just a bit, and others wanted the wine desperately and were willing to travel wherever to get a bottle of Heine wine. And I find that so very interesting. I want to thank you, TJ Donnelly. It, it has been a pleasure uh, talking with you about the history of Heine wine. And of course, if people want to get in touch with you, how would they do that? Well, uh, the company is West End Media Group, and we've got a website. And you can go on there. It doesn't mention Heine Wine. It does mention our amusement park business. But there's a there's a there's a way that you can contact us. Uh, so uh, that's one way. Uh, if they want to put a message at the bottom here on YouTube, you know, uh, I'll certainly get back to them, just saying, hey, contact us about Heine Wine, and I'll make it a point to uh, to contact them. Um, and I'll thank you, you know, for for uh, be willing to expose my Heine to the world. That was really nice. I, I appreciate it. <laughs> it was nice to expose your Heine. TJ Donnelly, a pleasure. Thank you, sir. Terry Dorsey was a popular morning radio personality in Dallas-Fort Worth since 1981. He retired from country station KSCS-FM in December after 26 years at the station. In the 1980s, Dorsey became known for his signature commercials for the fake Heine wine. His bit was so funny, it was nationally syndicated by Dorsey Donnelly Enterprise. Terry Dorsey arived in Dallas-Fort Worth in 1981, hired by then-General Manager T.J. Donnelly to do mornings at Country Station KPLX, where he had a successful run till he was hired away by KSCS in 1988. From the late 80s to the mid-90s, Mr. Dorsey's show ruled the Dallas-Fort Worth radio ratings. He's one of the few people who has won Air Personality of the Year awards from the Country Music Association, the Academy of Country Music, and Billboard magazine. He is also a member of the Country Disc Jockey Hall of Fame and the Texas Radio. Hall of Fame. Major country acts including Martina McBride, Asleep at the Wheel, Montgomery Gentry, and Ty Hendren, as well as sports personalities such as Troy Aikman and Terry Bradshaw appeared on the Dorsey Gang Morning Show. Sadly, shortly after his retirement, Terry Dorsey passed away unexpectedly in early March 2015. He was 66 years old. Check out past interviews on the Radio Memories YouTube channel and on Spotify. Click the links. This is Maggie McKay for Radio Memories, a Dave Schuyler production. Radio Memories.